It's right out of a story, a one-of-a-kind book millions of us would want to read, but it's being hidden away, kept secret for a hundred years. Now, if you're a Margaret Atwood fan, and who in this country is not, you will face that century-long wait to get a glimpse of a new work, a book that's written especially for a future library. Books are an excellent carbon capture mechanism. <laughs> Because as long as they're not burning, the carbon is sequestered in the book. <laughs> there you go, a positive, an extra benefit there. This is a story about the future, obviously, the hope that there will be a lot more of the future for all of us. And there's more to the story, too. This is event was in a clearing in a wood where 1,000 trees are growing, which will be the source of paper for Atwood's book and for the others that will fill the future library one day. Margaret Atwood is in Oslo, Norway, and what a pleasure to speak with her and indeed to meet her live this morning. Ms. Atwood, good morning to you. And good morning to you. We've been just uh, looking again, as we have been all through the morning, some of the images, the footage from that ceremony in Oslo, Norway. It looks delightful, and you look to be delighted by it. It was, it was very, very pleasant, and a lot of people were very touched by it, but uh, also we've had so much interest in this project from around the world. There's something about it that just grabs people. Well, that's interesting because in, in previous interviews, that's pretty much how you describe your own interest in this. When Katie Patterson, the Scottish artist who has launched the Future Library, asked you to take part, you said you were, you know, it was appealing to you from the outset. And what was it about that that was so attracting? Well, I think you either love this or, and get it right away or, or, or you just really don't. And uh, if you were the kind of kid who buried things in the backyard in a jar, uh, then you will understand it immediately. But it also combines uh, words with the things we print words on with the place where those uh, materials grow. And it's also a generational project. So you're handing on from generation to generation the people who will choose the writers of the last uh, 25 years or so of this project haven't even been born, I mean, nor have those writers been born. Well, l let's think about that for a moment. As, as you wrote a book, as you're writing this book, and I want to talk about the book in a second, but the whole process of writing for a reader, I don't know, can you even conceive of who your writer, uh, your reader will be in 2114? Well, you can't. Uh, you can make a, a few guesses, but imagine, for instance, Charles Dickens trying to imagine us reading his books 150 years on. Uh, we do read them, though, but maybe a bit differently from the way that people in his own age read them, because language changes over time and context changes over time. Our technologies change over time, and a lot of words drop out of use and new words come in. So. That's happening all the time. I was wondering if you took that into consideration as you were writing this particular book, if your choice of language, if your choice of plot or your references, did you gear those to be, you know, for maximum effect or maximum comprehension in the future? Well, since we don't know what that future is going to be, that's impossible to do. <laughs> that's true, I guess. But at least you presuppose that there is a future. I mean, there's an optimism yes. in that that there's yeah. going to be a humanity around in yeah. 2114 it's to read you. Yes, it's very hopeful on a number of levels. Number one, there will be people. Number two, there will be reading. Uh, there will be books. People will be interested in reading them. There will be an Oslo. There will be a forest. It will have grown. Uh, all of those are very, very hopeful things, but, but they're by no means foregone conclusions right now. The book itself, you told us the title during the ceremony, yes. Scribbler Moon. Lovely yes. title, Scribbler Moon. Now, since I won't be here in 2114, let me speak on behalf of all of your fans here in 2015 and say, you know, we'd love to know what it's about. Can you give us at least well, a hint? Can you tell us? Well, well, the title is a hint, but beyond that, you have to undertake to obey the rules when you say you're going to be one of these writers. And one of the rules is that you can't tell what's in the box. At all? Uh, at all. No, you can... The other rule is you can't just put images in, so you can't put your photo album in. So no images. It has to be words. Uh, but it can be any length. It doesn't have to be a book. It can be a text. 
It could be a single word, it could be a poem, it could be a short story, it could be a novel, it could be a non-fiction work, it could be your diary. Uh, it just has to be made of words, any length, and you can't tell. Those are the rules. So you, you can't even tell me the length of what you chose to, to write. Oh, well, I'm never going to get the first line from you then, am I? No matter how nicely I ask. <laughs> no, no, no. My, my, my mouth is zipped tight, and everyone is trying to get this out of me in every possible way. Isn't that but, interesting? Uh, no dice, no dice. But it is so incredible. You're, you're writing about the future? Can't tell you that. For the future. I, can't, it, it's can't interesting. Tell you that. <laughs> oh, you can't even tell me that. I might be writing about ancient Rome. You just don't know. Oh, but I guess I just assumed, given your, your, uh, your catalog, so often we look to the future. Maybe not this time. Well, look at that. Assume nothing. Your, li <laughs> your lips are sealed. You know, the one benefit, though, I suppose, from an author's perspective, you don't have to face mean-spirited literary critics in all of this. You'll never know. Oh, I don't have to face them, but think of the writers as we approach the 100-year mark. They're going to be under a lot of pressure because they know that their box will be opened when they are still alive. That is and true. not only that, all of their contemporaries' boxes will also be opened, and I'm sure invidious comparisons will be made. So they will be under a lot of pressure, whereas I'm as free as a bird. <laughs> Listen, I was uh, just refreshing my memory. You, you talked recently about having written a Twitter novel, taking part in that project, and now we have you in this literary time capsule with the future library. I was interested, is this the kind of project that at this point in your career interesting projects, innovative kind of directions. Is this what you're looking for at this point in, in Margaret Atwood's life? You mean, can I just have fun? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you just well, answered I've that. I've had quite a lot of fun, but, and I know it's wrong to say that. I know I'm supposed to say I'd suffer every time I sit down to write, which is sometimes true as well, but um, can I just have fun? I, I think probably you're a bit freer to do that when you have a career already, as it were, under your belt. Mm -hmm. So they probably won't be asking too many 25-year-olds to do this because I think the 25-year-olds are probably thinking, why would I you know, put so much time and effort into something that will not help establish my career, which will not um, earn me a living or any of those things that you have to really worry about when you're 25. True. Well, we are the richer for it. All right, this is my last opportunity to get you to tell all what the book, apart from Scribble or Moon, I'm, I'm just, for all of Canada to know, Ms. Atwood, we'd love to know. Okay, here's something I'm going to tell you. Okay. Uh, we're doing a contest on Wattpad, W-A-T-T-P-A-D dot com, in which the young and otherwise writers, the writers doing the contest, will write their own stories and incorporate that title somewhere in the story. Oh. So although you won't be able to read my stories, you will be able to read their stories built around Scribbler Moon. And I, for one, will be fascinated to see what they come up with. As will I. Well, for our great-grandchildren, I hope there is many, uh, many hours, there are many hours of reading an enjoyable reading of Scribbler Moon. Thank you so much for the time this morning. A pleasure to meet you and to speak with you there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Margaret Atwood, the very first author to go into the future library. So if you want to see that again, if you're a fan and who wouldn't be, as we said, or if you want to share that with someone who maybe is off to work already, we've posted the whole thing to our Twitter account, and it's there for you at CBC Morning Show.